Well, a professor was teaching a class on a college campus. And it was about midway from the, through the semester that there was a student sitting in her classroom. And the student was always in class, but never participated other than taking very studious notes from the lecture. But that day, on the front of this particular student's shirt was a large letter K. That is all that was on the shirt. No affiliation with a sports team, no other group's logo graced the front of the shirt to give clues or offerings what the K stood for. The next class, the same student was wearing the same shirt, same large letter K with no other indication of what it could be. And since it was a college campus, the professor didn't think much about the fact that a student was wearing the same shirt again. Maybe he didn't have quarters for laundry. Maybe he didn't have time to wash the shirt. Maybe it was coincidence that he wore the shirt again and the student didn't realize that he wore the shirt the last time there was class. And then the next class comes and the same student is wearing that same shirt with the same large letter K. And then at the next class, and at the next class. The whole time the professor has been wondering what this K stands for, and now it is no longer a coincidence that the same student is wearing the same shirt day after day. And as much as the professor wanted to know, she just couldn't bring herself to ask about the shirt. She didn't want to look a fool for asking a question she should have known the answer to. And then one day, the professor just couldn't help herself. As the class was leaving, the professor pulled the student aside and said, excuse me, I have noticed that you have been wearing the same shirt with the same exact letter K to the class for weeks. I have scoured the internet and the, and the news to see if there was something you were protesting or a cause that you were trying to bring awareness to, and I couldn't find a thing. Would you mind letting me know what that letter K stands for? And the student with a, with a puzzled look on his face said, sure, it stands for confused. And the professor was beside herself. She looks at the student and says, I, I think you might have some problems spelling. You don't spell confused with the letter K. And the student shot back his answer, you have no idea how confused I am. <laughs> In today's gospel lesson, the disciples are the ones that are confused. And as we go through the gospel, it seems that they are confused more times than not as they interact with Jesus and more, as they get more knowledge about who he is, they keep on getting confused. It's as if they're wearing shirts with the letter K on the front. Jesus teaches and the disciples are confused. It seems that Jesus is trying to get some rest today in the lesson. At the very least, he is trying to get away from the crowds of people that have been following him around for much of Mark's gospel. He has taken his disciples on a walk through Galilee, and Mark tells us that he did not want anyone to know what he was doing. He wanted to take the time to teach his disciples, to focus on their teachings. So he was teaching once again that day about Messiah and what it means for him and what, it will, and what will happen to him. And Jesus using this reference for himself the son of man when he talks about himself and when he talks about messiah and all this and it results in confusion they are still puzzled they don't understand what this talk of betrayal is well who would among us would betray you they don't understand this talk of being killed because the messiah should free them from that fear of being killed and they don't understand this rise again after three days. What does that mean? Is this all code words and we just don't understand? And it seems like they are confused with a capital K. And in their confusion, they're afraid to ask Jesus what he means. 
The last time that Jesus talked about Messiah, it was Peter who correctly identified who Jesus was, but then things got all messed up. Maybe they are afraid to ask Jesus what he means because the last time it turned out that the one of them tried to explain to Jesus who Jesus was, it really didn't go very well for that person. Peter still remembers that biting remark, get behind me, Satan. Maybe that's why they're afraid to ask. And so they stay quiet. And after this, they go on to Capernaum. And once there, they get settled down in the house for some rest and food. And Jesus asks them, what were they talking about on the road? The disciples were talking on the road and must have thought that they were either far enough away from Jesus or quiet enough that he wouldn't be able to hear them. So this question would result in another time where they were quiet in front of their rabbi nothing to offer. They knew he knew. They knew that they had nothing to offer in their defense. They didn't want to admit that they were arguing about who would be the greatest. Was it Peter? He named Jesus as the Messiah first, but then again, he was rebuked. Was it James or John? Was it another of them? They are silent before their rabbi. And they all journey, they are all on this journey towards Jerusalem and the cross, even if they don't realize at this point that this is the journey that they are on. And they have been arguing about who among them is the greatest. It is no wonder that they are silent. They talk about who is the greatest among them even after Jesus' teaching, even after Peter's great confession, even after Jesus has rebuked Peter for denying that he would be crucified, even after Jesus has told them that anyone who comes after him must take up his cross and their cross and follow him. Even after all of that, they are still impervious to his teachings. Had these obstinate disciples learned anything? Apparently not. They are confused with a capital K again. So Jesus takes the time to reassure them in their confusion Jesus doesn't dress them down. Jesus doesn't tell them that they are wrong to think about greatness. They are just confused about what defines greatness in the coming kingdom of the Messiah, just like they were confused about what Messiah means. And in their confusion, Jesus tries yet again to explain what living in the kingdom means. He says to them, Sit down here with me for a while and let me teach you the ways of the kingdom. Then Jesus begins to teach these disciples that never seem to learn. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant, servant of all. There are times in my life when I just try to be quiet and keep what I am thinking to myself. I must not be very good at it because my wife will always know what's going on. Spouses have a way of doing that. I try to be quiet, but my face shouts louder than I ever could. The disciples' faces must have been shouting their confusion and their unbelief at Jesus' statement. While they were silent, their faces must have just screamed. They must be thinking, what do you mean that to be great, you must be a servant? Jesus, that doesn't make sense. Servants aren't great servants. Serve the great people in this world. Knowing that his disciples are not understanding and wanting to be clear, 
Jesus takes a child and explains it all to them. He puts a finer point on what he means to be great in the kingdom of God. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. This is a radical statement. We've heard it all growing up in our Sunday school days. Don't miss how radical this statement is. How countercultural Jesus telling them to welcome the child is. You see, a child is at the bottom of the social ladder, and their culture, the culture of the day, had a different view of children than we do in our day. Jesus uses one who is considered property, or possibly even inhuman in the first century, a child to demonstrate what he is talking about. Jesus takes the time to reassure them in their confusion that it is simpler than they are making it to be. They are making things complicated when in reality it is just simple. To welcome a child is to welcome me. Jesus, in essence, is saying, Why wouldn't you welcome me? To welcome me, you welcome the child, the outsider, the downtrodden. And when you welcome the child, the outsider, the downtrodden, you welcome me. And Jesus says, not only me, but you welcome the one who sent me. God the Father. Their confusion is a blessing because it simply leads to being reassured. He tells them and us there is reassurance that even when things in this world don't make sense, that there I will be with you. Confusion but also reassurance. Don't worry, my disciples, he is saying. Don't worry. I know it is hard for you, but it isn't as hard as you're making it. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, he keeps reassuring these disciples in their confusion time and time and time again. This world is a confusing place, isn't it? I wish I could understand how we ended up here. Where did things go wrong? We want to be able to point to a certain point in time, a certain event, to show that that, right there, that is where we went wrong. That is the thing that happened. That is where we got off track. Just fix that little thing there and we'll be able to understand. Just fix that one thing and the world will be put right. How often have you been confused by the happenings of this world? I think one of the things that I hear most often from people in this kind of conversation is, is what has the world come to? How many times have you read the news and just shook your head in confusion? What has the world come to? Maybe you just avoid the news altogether because you're just sick and tired of all the bad news and you just avoid it. You can look at all sorts of things and wonder what is going on, but also at the same point in time you can keep it at arm's length because it doesn't directly affect you. But then there's the things that hit a little bit closer to home. Things we can't shut out. 
and things that invade our nice little suburban lives, even if we have done everything right. Things that make us confused with a capital K. Things that make us ask, why me? Why them? Things that make us ask, why God, oh, why? In our confusion and hurt and pain, don't we crave just a little reassurance? There are times when we sure could use the reassurance of God in our lives. The reassurance that God is present in our lives, present to us and with us and for us. That the God, that God knows what we're going through, reassurance that God is present in our lives. And when we are confused, when we could sure use a roadmap for how to live our lives, we wonder where God is. And if we're honest, sometimes we might wonder, did God abandon us? So today's lesson isn't the last time that the, gospel, the, the disciples will be confused by Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus will continue to explain to them that eventually he will be betrayed and handed over to the authorities. And then later in the gospel, the betrayal is at hand. It is there in the upper room that Jesus tells them for the final time what will happen to them and what will happen to him. And the disciples are scared and they are confused and they have been told that Peter, the one who was supposed to be the greatest among them, the leader, that Peter, the, the one who upon, the, was the rock who Jesus was going to build the church, that Peter would fail them and deny Jesus three times. And the one who would betray Jesus has slipped out into the night and Jesus tells them that, th that his time has come. And he tells them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. And they're confused. I would be too. Confused because Jesus has been talking about about this for three years and now it is happening so quickly and Jesus tells them that he will go ahead of them to prepare a place for them in the kingdom in my father's house there are many rooms but they're still confused and Thomas speaks up Lord we do not know where you are going how can we know the way and, and Thomas wants a road map to this place where Jesus is going, a physical map. Show us the way, Lord, Thomas says, and surely we will follow. And Jesus responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He, in essence, tells them, I have already shown you the way. Words of reassurance, not words of division. And Thomas, like us, just wants a road map. And Jesus assures him, reassures him, that there is no need for a map. There's no need to get your phone out and ask Siri for directions. Jesus himself is the map. Jesus is the way. No need for physical directions when you know the navigator. And Jesus will take them in their confusion and lead them home. Jesus, the map. All we need. When the world doesn't make sense, Jesus reassures us in our confusion. When we have our questions, and our doubts. 
Jesus is there with us in all of that. And we don't know which way to turn, which way is which. We turn to Jesus. And he will be there no matter what. Arms wide open, calling us home. Amen.